Hello there, I'm Erin Aid. This is Boom Bus coming to you from New York, and here are some of the stories that we're tracking for you today. Now, as Greece marches closer to a bailout deadline, European finance ministers will take another stab at hammering out a deal between Greece and its creditors next week. But how likely are they to reach an agreement? That's the big question, and I'll tell you all about it coming right up. Then Mark Faber is back on the show today to discuss China and the U.S. markets. And Boombus producer Bianca Faschini brings us a full report on the fuzzy circumstances surrounding D.C.'s residents' right to get stoned. It all starts right now. The standoff between Greece and its creditors rolls on with only two weeks left until Greece's current bailout program expires. Eurozone finance ministers will take another stab at hammering out a deal between Greece and its creditors on Monday. Now, the talks on Monday are key because they are the last chance for the new Greek government to ask for a technical extension of its current bailout program, which runs out on February 28th. Now, Greece needs the extension in order to guarantee continued official financing and also to be eligible for negotiations on more time to repay the Eurozone loans that they've already received. Now, currently, market borrowing is just far too expensive for Athens. And despite the German people's enthusiasm for Yanis Varoufakis as a person, German Chancellor Angela Merkel reiterated her government's hardline stance on Greece's options for a fiscal rescue, saying Athens could either complete all the requirements of its 172 billion euro bailout by the end of the month or request an extension of the program beyond its February deadline. Merkel's comments came after Thursday's EU summit in Brussels, where Greece's new prime minister, Alexis Tsipras, met with Merkel and other key Eurozone officials. The chancellor's comments raised the stakes ahead of Monday's critical meeting. Now, Tsipras won elections in January on the promise of ending the 240 billion euro bailout and the rigid reforms that came with it. Tsipras has said that he doesn't want to ask for an extension at all, even by a few months. Now, if Greece doesn't ask for a bailout extension on Monday, the program would expire and Athens would have to apply for a new full-fledged bailout. This would be the country's third, mind you. Now, it's a very distinct possibility that that will happen, and it's quite likely that Greece will ultimately have to start discussions on a new bailout program after this month. To discuss China and the U.S. market, Mark Faber is back on the show today. Mark is editor and publisher of the Gloom, Doom and Boom Report and director of Mark Faber Limited. Now, I first asked Mark for his macro view on China today. Take a look at what he had to say. Well, I've been arguing for now more than a year that the Chinese economy was decelerating much more than what uh, analysts expected, and I think if China is growing at the present time at 4%, that's about the maximum it is growing. Having said that, China is a country with a population twice the size of the U.S. and Europe combined. combined. And like the U.S., you have uh, different provinces. In the U.S., you have different states. So what can happen is that, say, in one state, uh, there is a recession, or in one industry there is a recession, and in other states or other provinces, the country is still growing. But very clearly, in some provinces, there is already a recession. Now, how would someone be able to express the view that you just articulated in terms of an investment strategy? Well, I think it's quite simple. I suppose you and your viewers and I, we have no clue how the world will look like in five years' time. This is a, a recognition of the fact. We just don't know. There are so many issues, and there have always been in the past so many issues that you can't predict the future. So in absence of being able to predict the future, 
I would recommend people to hold a diversified portfolio and uh, not leverage too much. I have no leverage. I own my properties paid outright. I own physical gold and I don't store the physical gold in the US. I store it outside and I own some shares and I own some bonds and then I go and sleep happily. <laughs> and that's what everyone wants, sleeping happily. That's, that's the most, that's the key right there. You know, Mark, China's pivot away from the economic sectors like infrastructure and housing filled up with malinvestment is causing a decline in commodity demand growth. And the world is flooded with industrial commodities. In fact, the Australian bank ANZ, for example, thinks we will see a record glut of iron ore that takes price downs to $58 a metric ton. So what's your view on the industrial commodity space? Well, my view is obviously with a first of all my view is that the global economy is slowing down and not accelerating like the optimists in the US will claim so that is my overall view and also bulk of the incremental demand for commodities in the last 15 years came from China say for industrial commodities China went from 12% of global consumption to 47% of global consumption. So that lifted commodity prices dramatically. Plus, there was money printing that also contributed to the rise in industrial commodities. Now, now this is not there anymore. As I pointed out, Chinese growth at very best, and there could be a bust, but at very best, uh, will slow down or has slowed down to around 4%. I think it's even slower than that. But the point is, yes, industrial commodities will go down for a while, and uh, then they'll stabilize and again go up, because I'm involved in mining. As a director of mining companies, I can see that the cost of mining has gone up dramatically. Now, like you said, you know, the U.S. market, it's very expensive. And the S&P 500 trades at 17.6 times trailing earnings right now. And this is despite a decline in earnings growth. So how do you see the U.S. market doing in 2015? <laughs> I have to laugh. Who knows what the earnings are? They're like the statistics published by the U.S. government. <laughs> They're probably all doctored. So maybe on a normalized basis, the S&P PE is maybe much higher. All I know, and this is a relatively uh, valuable measure of valuation, is the price to sales of the S&P 500 is at the highest level ever. Highest level ever. And sales are less doctored than earnings. Wow. I mean, that's something to think about. Uh, you know, I, I noticed recently that we're now seeing the largest percentage of companies coming to the market with no earnings since the dot-com days. But actually, unlike back then, the companies are not all tech. It's biotech companies, you know, pharmaceuticals, that are, uh, you know, a big hit there. So why are people piling into stocks with no earnings, Mark? Why is that? Look. A mania, a bubble is a bubble. People don't buy things because they have value. They buy things, stocks, because they think they'll go up. So if I'm a speculator, what do I care about the valuation of a stock? If I think tomorrow it will go up, I'll buy it. And hedge funds do the same. I'm not saying that this is the strategy I would uh, recommend for wealth preservation. And I think we are today in a situation where investors should think first, how do I not lose money? And only in the second place, how will I make money? Because the valuations argue against making a lot of money for the next 10 years, whether it's in bonds, or inequity, say you buy a 10-year U.S. Treasury, 
the maximum you will earn is slightly below 2% per year. That's 2% per year. That is the maximum you will earn. The stock market, it may go up another 5, 10% here, maybe even 20%. But afterwards, it drops 50%. The damage will, will be colossal. Now, JP Morgan noted a week ago that globally, $3.6 trillion of bonds carry a negative yield. And that number is rising. Countries in Europe, in fact, they're even issuing paper with a negative yield at auction. That seems insane to me, no? Well, uh, please write a letter to the Federal Reserve <laughs> and to other central banks and tell them. It's not my mistake, you understand? I agree with you, but this is what the professors and the academics at central banks have done. That's precisely what they've done. And it will lead to a complete disaster. That's why I'm saying you have to, you have to at some point short central banks <laughs> because they have no clue what they're doing. <laughs> Say, an insurance company, they have premium incomes, but they also have significant investment income, okay? So with rates at this level, they will have to increase premiums significantly or cut benefits. That was Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Doom and Boom Report and director of Mark Faber Limited. Time now for a very quick break, but stick around because when we return, we're bringing you highlights from some of our best interviews here on the show this past week. Then Boombus producer Bianca Vashini will tell us how a government spending bill got in the way of a local ballot initiative to legalize pot in the nation's capital. True story. Plus, remember, you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt and on Hulu at hulu.com slash boom dash bust. Now, as we head to break, here are some of your closing numbers of the bell. Don't go anywhere. I'm a fighter. I can take a punch. I live. I learn something every day. I strike when I need to strike. I prepare. I've earned everything I have. If I fall, I get back up. I won't be underestimated. I'm Aaron Aid, and I put the boom into Boom Bus. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. The only show I go out of my way to watch every week. It really packs a punch. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. So you visit the doctor for a routine checkup, and he tells you that you need immediate surgery. But I've been healthy my whole life, you say. No, he says, you must be feeling pain. And you say, but I don't feel any pain. Let's get you prepped, but scalpel, please. And you don't say a thing. You just take it. It's the same with news. You can just sit back and take that first opinion, or you can get a second opinion. Well, 
Welcome back to the show. Up now is Boom Bus producer Bianca Faschini's report on how a government spending bill in Washington, D.C. got in the way of a local ballot initiative to legalize pot. So why, when, and how did it all go up in smoke? Take a look. Though the decision to legalize marijuana has essentially been left to state governments, legalization activists in the District of Columbia are finding themselves at odds with federal lawmakers. In November of 2014, D.C. voters supported a ballot initiative on legalizing marijuana. There were enough signatures that it got on the ballot, and uh, the voters voted overwhelmingly. I think it was close to 70 percent last November, November 4th, to approve the initiative. Despite the initial success, city council members learned that Congress used the federal spending bill passed in December of 2014 to strike the ballot down. When Congress adopted our budget, because only Congress can adopt our budget, even though uh, $7 billion is raised through local taxes and parking meters and fees of all sorts, Congress has to approve our budget. And in the Appropriation Act, they added this rider that said that we could spend no dollars this year to enact the initiative, even though the initiative was already enacted when the voters approved it. As part of the Home Rule Act, the D.C. Council sent the measure to Congress anyway. They also planned to hold hearings on how to regulate and tax potential legalization until the D.C. Attorney General warned council members and their staff that if they did, they could face fines of up to $5,000 each and two years in prison. They addressed this in an appropriation bill. Rather than repealing what the voters approved in the district, they said that for fiscal year 2015, no dollars could be spent to enact the initiative. Well, at the end of fiscal year 2015, that prohibition goes away. Though President Obama's budget proposal, released earlier this year, would allow D.C. to use local revenue to enact initiatives, the council will still have to fight with Congress over the ballot, a cause that Chairman Mendelson says is about more than making money for the district. There's a widespread acceptance of marijuana as not being a dangerous drug. And uh, therefore, why are we throwing people in jail for it? Until the D.C. City Council and voters have the right to fully determine the laws in the district, it looks like we have more to worry about than just potential revenue and profits. In Washington, Bianca Faschini, RT. And there you have it. Now it's time for this week's Defining Moments. Take a look at what some of our guests had to say on Greece, quantitative easing, oil, and more. Enjoy. What's being suggested by Syriza is, is, is quite sensible. It's, and Giannis has been thinking this out for about six years now. If you look at the detail of the, the proposal, it's always been about how do we manage to get the maximum uh, improvement in our current situation without breaking existing EU rules and without needing any new institutions. So all it takes is for the Germans to look at it and say, yeah, that's quite sensible. That would reduce, uh, take, take, uh, that, reduce the serviceable load on your debt from 10 percent to 1 percent, which is probably the most the important proposal that uh, Giannis has put forward about reclassifying debt that's within the Maastricht Treaty as being backed by the ECB but still paid for by each nation. Uh, it's extremely reasonable and all it takes the Germans is the sense to say yes that's reasonable, uh, we will let you do it. Equally for the whole thing about going from having this ridiculous 4.5% uh, surplus they're aiming for down to 1.5% which is still not as far as I think it should go but again a very sensible change. So it's obstinacy on the, on the German and the EU side that will cause this to fall apart if it falls apart at all. What's driving nominal GDP is bank credit creation for GDP transactions. Um, I, I proposed this um, already over 20 years ago. It's called the quantity theory of credit. And what's, what's driving the economy and asset prices is credit creation, because that's the real money supply, bank credit creation. But you need to separate it into two streams because different type of credit will have a different type of impact. Bank credit that is lent to borrowers that will use it in the economy, say business investment or even consumption, that will drive nominal GDP. But if you extend bank credit for financial transaction, in other words for purchases of ownership rights, 
you know, financial assets, uh, real assets. Um, this will affect asset prices, but it will not affect GDP. Asset transactions, property transactions, financial transa transactions, they're not part of GDP. They don't contribute to GDP. But they will, of course, this bank credit for those transactions, that will affect uh, asset prices. So by disaggregating credit into these two streams, we already can identify um, times and sources of, of credit, uh, well, financial booms, asset booms driven by bank credit. So they're always driven by bank credit. And then we can forecast nominal GDP by looking at the bank credit that's used for GDP transactions. I think a deal will eventually be done, um, basically because I don't think it's in anybody's interests that Greece leaves. We talk a lot about the effect on Greece and um, it would be disastrous, it would be instant default because um, they would effectively ha um, have to introduce a new currency very fast, they would have to re-denominate all their debts into the new currency and that would be regarded as default, either that or leave them in euros that they don't have um, and then not be able to pay them because they didn't have enough euros which would also be default. So however you look at it, it's bad news, for, it would be bad news for Greece, at least in the short term. There is the question over whether in the longer term it might be good for them. Sometimes countries that default and introduce new currencies do actually do quite well um, in the medium to longer term. Um, so there is that question about whether it would be that disastrous for them looking further ahead. But certainly it's a short term hit would be horrible for a country that's already in deep recession. Um, for the rest of the periphery, Varoufakis' view is that if Greece left, it would set a precedent that the others would be likely to follow. And I have to say that also appears to be Signor Draghi's view. If you look back at his speech made in Helsinki in November, he observed that the euro had to be irreversible in all its states. If one of them left, then it would set a precedent. It would cross a line that must not be crossed. And after that, others could leave. It would no longer be a single currency. It would be simply a hard currency pair. Structurally, the banking industry has changed. Um, it's not going to be nearly as profitable as it was over the previous 10 years. Uh, that banking bubble is gone and it's not gone from a cyclical perspective, saying once we get into the next economic cycle, it's gone from a structural perspective. Uh, regulation and the regulatory environment is more stringent. Technology is going to take a lot of the profit margin from banks. And uh, the ZERP, which is now NERP environment, is making many banks struggle, both the U.S. banks and the foreign banks, particularly since many of the foreign entity, uh, many of the foreign nations have uh, NERP, which is negative interest rate policy, with all their bonds going up to around five years. Negative interest rates mean that they charge you to lend them money. Um, banks can survive in such a low interest rate environment. The Danish banks are offering mortgages at one and a half percent. Now, if you consider how risky the real estate and mortgage business is, and they're offering one and a half percent gross, there's very slim chance you could break a profit. And if you risk adjust that profit and adjust it for inflation, it's almost a guaranteed loss. Um, now, we also have the currency wars. We have the uh, euro going into QE, trying to match the United States. You have Japan, of course, the inventor of QE. You have China, which are dropping rates uh, you have, and manipulating currency. Then you have uh, Switzerland, which has broken the peg. And then you have Denmark, which is, says they're not going to break the peg. But then again, so did uh, Switzerland and so did the Bank of England. When Soros broke it and won his two billion pounds in profits. So these wars going back and forth, basically the attempt to export um, unemployment and deflation to your country, to your neighbor, is going to wreak havoc on the banks. When the Swiss franc depegged and shut up 20 percent, a lot of the small FX brokerages, um, some of them went bust, some of them needed bailouts like FXCM, and uh, many of them uh, didn't show stress up front. The reason is because a lot of them are arms with bigger banks. That stress is going to uh, manifest itself in the next quarterly earnings season for banks, where you're going to see uh, significant turmoil. I think what a lot of people miss is that the rig count is drilling of new wells. So you could have the rig count drop by 25% as it has, or 50% as it's projected, and that would still mean new wells are being created and produced. And we're seeing that in the figures. The oil production figures are going up. So the, so the first, and I think the most important headline, is that the rig count is not dropping fast enough to actually result in a reduce 
in a reduction of oil supply in, the nor in North America. We know that supply is not being reduced in, in uh, foreign countries where there's social pressures to keep the oil revenues up. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to cut oil production. They don't want to be the swing producer. So we're seeing supply actually increase when we know that supply is already exceeding demand. Some people say by 400,000 barrels a day, I, I'd suggest it's probably more like a million barrels a day of extra oil flowing into inventories each day and there's virtually no place left to store all that extra oil. So that's what we're seeing is price pressure on oil and I would expect oil to go down further. Like everything else, technology is, is very positive, but it's also very disruptive. And uh, in, the, in, in the financial services space, what technology is doing on the one hand is making it more accessible, more liquid. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's also making it in some ways more difficult for investors who don't have the sophistication or the access to resources that, that the others, you know, the bigger investors do. So uh, w what I'm trying to do at this point in my career is work on things that, that bring the stock market to kind of the, the average guy, so to speak. Uh, there's plenty of companies out there serving the institutional and high net worth investor, mm -hmm. and those are the folks that really are out there in the market every day. But uh, I kind of feel like uh, sort of the, the little guy is being left behind in some ways. Okay. And uh, I'd like to see us use technology in a way to really help everyone kind of democratize the market. And so would we democratize the market. That's important. Those were some of our best guests from this past week. All of our guests are great, but those were some that we actually just wanted to highlight. That is all for now, but we do love hearing from you, so please check out our Facebook page. Drop us a line, facebook.com slash boombustrt, and please do not forget to tweet at us at Aaron Aid, at Edward NH, at Bianca Faschini. And also next week coming up on Monday, we have Warren Mosler, and then on Tuesday, we have Paul Craig Roberts coming to us from his fancy exotic winter locale. Find out where he'll be. From all of us here at Boombus, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.